All right, well, welcome everybody to today's Sophie seminar. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the seminar series. And today I'm very happy to be hosting Da Cheng Zhu from the Chicago Booth School of Business. His discussant will be my colleague, George Tauken from Duke University. We're going to be following the same format as in previous weeks with 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 minutes for the discussant and 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, if you have a question during the seminar, you can either use the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, or you can type your question into the Q&A box. And if you would prefer, I know some people have microphone issues, you can type it and say that you'd rather I read out your question, or you can type it and then I'll call on you to, to read it out. I'll leave it to you to decide. Um, right, I think that was all the announcements. So uh, on that, I'll turn it over to Da Cheng. All right, <clears throat> thanks Andrew for the kind invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present um, at, at this uh, interesting uh, platform. Uh, so today I'd like to share uh, with you guys uh, a recent work uh, jointly written with uh, Yassine Sehali and uh, Jean Zuclat. So this is our first time uh, present this paper. It might as, as well be the last time uh, given that this, uh, this presentation is gonna be posted online. So um, this is a methodological paper uh, you know, so uh, it sits on the, uh, at the confluence of uh, two large strands of literature on, uh, on uh, uh, empirical asset pricing and high frequency financial econometrics. So we're gonna consider, uh, we're gonna propose an inference procedure uh, for risk premium, which is uh, arguably one of the key uh, important parameters in empirical asset pricing. And we're gonna explore it on higher frequency data to help us um, you know, uh, to help us uh, work with the most general uh, setting, uh, you know, to, to conduct inference on risk premium. So let me start with a, a quick uh, re overview of the econometrics approach in asset pricing. You know, so um, the linear factor model was the uh, workhorse model for the cross section of equity returns since the beginning of the asset pricing literature, right? So the Kaplan model, um, the multi-factor asset pricing model in arbitrary pricing theory and the Fama French factor models are uh, classical examples uh, of linear factor models. And um, the standard approach to estimate linear factor models in this literature is this two pass regression approach, um, which has been adopted uh, by Asoli as Fama uh, and Macbeth, 1973 GPE. Uh, so, with this approach, we can uh, estimate uh, risk premium, we can construct uh, mimicking portfolios for factors. And we can estimate the stochastic discount factor and we could test the risk premium. Oh, so we could test for alpha. And uh, pretty much every single, uh, you know, interesting applications in pure asset pricing uh, kind of rely on this two-pass regression approach. Um, now, if we recall the two-pass procedure, the first pass estimates individual factor loadings by regressing the time series of equity returns onto the factors. And in the second pass, uh, we typically regress the cross-section of average returns onto the estimated factor loadings from the first pass. Now, Fama and Macbeth, they suggest uh, conducting the second pass for each cross-section. So suppose we're looking at uh, monthly data, uh, we, you know, they would suggest running cross-sectional regressions at each month, and then make use of the sample average of these monthly estimates of local risk premium and then take their standard errors uh, for inference. Uh, while there have been many refinements implemented over the past years, the basic structure of the inference procedure for uh, these linear factor models remains the same. All right, so, but, but if you think about uh, this model, there are uh, two obvious limitations of linear factor models, right? So the financial econometrics literature have documented uh, complex dynamics of realized returns, right? So we have learned <clears throat> the existence of stochastic volatility and jumps and all these things, uh, you know, simple linear models uh, fail to incorporate. And moreover, individual equity returns respond to these factors with time varying risk exposures, uh, you know, which is not so convenient uh, for linear models. On the other hand, it is also natural to expect that risk exposures to these dis dissimilar risk components like volatility and jumps are rewarded differently, right? So for instance, 
investors can be expected to demand different premium for bearing the tail risks of uh, systematic factors, right? So, uh, you know, momentum crash would be one of the, uh, you know, tail risk, uh, you know, in, in, in one of the systematic factors other than the market. All right, so now if you think about the status quo of the high frequency econometrics literature, uh, you know, we, we have known, we have learned that these high frequency observations are, you know, very useful to address the first issue, namely the estimating factor loadings uh, in richer models. Um, however, the second issue, identifying risk premium, requires an expensive time span and as a result, uh, different tools. And what we develop in this paper is a two pass procedure for continuous time factor models in a very general setting that relies on the increasing sampling frequency and the increasing time span. And the continuous time factor model we consider allows for salient features of equity returns, such as stochastic volatility, jumps, leverage effect, all those things um, that are well documented in financial econometrics. And uh, we are also gonna allow, uh, you know, um, uh, general idiosyncratic components, factor loadings, uh, risk premium, and uh, unbalance the data, right? So, because we're gonna deal with individual stock returns, uh, so uh, we, we need to take care of the unbalanced data as well. All right, so let me spend a few minutes on the uh, closely related uh, literature. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the incomplete list, and uh, you know, I would refer uh, the audience to look at uh, other papers uh, in our reference. So uh, basically, um, the literature has long been aware of the fact that individual equity returns feature time varying risk exposures and rewards dating back to Rosenberg's uh, GFQA paper, uh, you know, where uh, the MSCI BARA framework was originally proposed, which is now widely used among practitioners. And uh, since then, there's lots of extensions to conditional factor models. Uh, some noted examples, including uh, the Connor et al. paper and uh, Gagliardini's paper, uh, and also Kelly's recent paper in JFE. So all these are conditional factor models for, uh, for, stock, uh, for individual stocks. And uh, now in terms of the two-pass regression, Shankin's earlier work pro provides the first rigorous analysis of the asymptotic behavior of the two-pass regression, but for unconditional factor models. Uh, so they take into, uh, he takes into account uh, the first pass estimation error in the betas of test sets. Well, there have been many refinements uh, you know, about, about uh, the Feynman Macbeth procedure, uh, including Kleinbergen's paper, uh, Kahn's paper, and uh, you know, um, Paul's paper, uh, et cetera. All right, so all these papers are, uh, you know, are based on the linear factor model in discrete time. And most of them are relying on uh, kind of restrictive, uh, you know, parametric assumptions. Uh, you know, Connor's paper uh, and Connor Hockman and Linton's paper is an exception where they use a uh, semi-parametric approach, um, but, but still it's uh, quite restrictive compared to what we're going to work on. So uh, in terms of the diffusion models and double asymptotics, you know, we're gonna rely on long span asymptotics and small data. So large team small data asymptotics uh, in this paper. And, uh, you know, so the earlier work by Bendy and Phillips in Colometrica have used this uh, asymptotic uh, scheme to estimate diffusion models. Uh, you know, we are gonna look at two pass regressions in a much more general class of models. So uh, in terms of, um, you know, other related work, on and Christensen's GFE and Chan and All's uh, paper uh, in QE are also uh, related to test of AFAS using uh, non-parametric or parametric time series regressions in continuous time. Um, but their test cannot be used to distinguish different components of risk premium because they do not have jumps in it. Uh, and they're not applicable to, uh, to non-treatable vectors. Uh, because uh, they do not use uh, cross-sectional regression. So they basically use time series regression uh, for, for estimating the alphas, and that can only be used for treatable factors. So, um, right. So this kind of literature um, is quite related to what we're doing. 
uh, in, in the sense that you're estimating the drift components as well, but uh, they mainly focus on diffusion models. All right, so now in terms of high frequency factor and regression models, uh, you know, so uh, there's a large literature, a long list of papers uh, related to estimating betas uh, in a variety of uh, different, uh, different settings. Uh, so um, obviously um, the existing literature focused on the inference for the second moment, like all these quadratic variations, um, but uh, for, for, for uh, you, you, in which case a fixed asymptotic scheme is sufficient, uh, but in the current paper, we're gonna go beyond uh, this um, uh, you know, setting, we're gonna look at uh, risk premium, which is the first moment. And uh, for that, a fixed asymptotic scheme is, is not enough. All right, so now let me start uh, setting up the model and, uh, and then I'm gonna discuss uh, the identification problem uh, in, in this setting. All right, so we're gonna introduce the dynamics of the following components uh, step by step. Uh, to use my notation for our presentation, we're gonna focus on the single factor, uh, single factor model. Uh, so you can, you can think of the market factor, uh, you know, so, uh, and uh, of course uh, the paper deals with uh, general case uh, throughout. All right, so let me start with the uh, factor dynamics. All right, so we assume that uh, the dynamics of the log factor follows uh, Ito semi Martingale, where uh, we have the drift component, the continuous component, which is driven by a standard Brownian motion, and the jump component. Um, and the jump has a finite, uh, finite variation and potentially infinite activity. And, uh, you know, so there are mainly two types of uh, risk components in this single factor F, right? So there's a continuous risk associated with a continuous part and the jump risk associated with the jumps of F. And uh, with itself, a uh, priority two components, right? So the times at which those jumps occur is, uh, is uh, random and the jump size are also random. Uh, well, there is a caveat uh, that I need, I need to be careful about because uh, the number of factors is ambiguous, right? Because we have a, you know, arguably single factor FT, but there are multiple risk components. Uh, for example, the continuous component, the jump component, which could be rewarded uh, differently. So I'm going to call this risk component and, uh, and this I would call it a single factor model. All right, so now let me set up the, uh, the assumptions on the, uh, the dynamics on the, on the jump part first. Right, so uh, you know, in general, we might think that we could have a jump risk for each possible jump size X. All right, so, um, and um, uh, if we were to use this uh, assumption, then the number of distinct jump risk is literally infinite, unless the set of possible jump sizes is finite. And obviously we don't want to deal with that. So we, 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 we would work with, um, we, we have to work around uh, this problem. And, uh, you know, uh, estimating jump risk premium would become uh, infeasible for at least two reasons, right? So first of all, we typically have a finite sample of assets. So in that regard, we have a finite number of equations. We cannot deal with the infinite number of uh, risk premium parameters. And uh, in addition, we cannot learn risk premium for jumps of a particular size that did not realize within the sampling window, even though such jump sizes could occur afterwards, right? So, so, so that's why you know, we, we cannot really handle the infinite number of jumps. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, we uh, can, uh, Ching, uh, yeah. may I interrupt for a moment? Sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a question in the Q&A box and there's also I have a question that I would like to ask if I could. Having read your paper on the, uh, the previous, was it this slide? No, th th this one here. Yeah, so why is it that uh, you have to treat each jump size separately? That's a little, uh, it seems to me unusual, but obviously I'm missing something. Oh, so this is the most general possible setting, right? So most generally speaking, you could, you know, think of having each jump size as an individual risk factor and which could be rewarded differently. But obviously, as you, you know, anticipated, uh, this is perhaps too general and we have to narrow it a bit uh, to make the whole procedure feasible. And this is why I'm going to, uh, this is what I'm going to do in the, in the next slide. I see, okay, yeah. all right. And then I have a, another question and um, 
I'll call on, it's from Gustavo Schwenkler. Let me um, unmute him to ask his question. Uh, Gustavo, you can go ahead. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, Dacheng, <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation. I just had a quick question that just trying to understand exactly what you're doing. Is it mostly just kind of like an, an, an approach to uh, figure out how to best handle the data or is it also kind of like looking at kind of model construction? Because I always believe that the main issue in these kind of ish, in, in, in kind of estimating risk free and continuous time models is that you have to specify the p-dynamics kind of correctly. And if you don't get the p-dynamics right, then it's really hard to do this anyways. Thank you, right. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that is why in this paper, we're gonna propose a non-parametric approach where these components are you know, very general, and we, we do not make any specific parametric assumptions on those uh, to alleviate the concerns that you have. Okay, but you do have to specify the number of factors, I guess, in a way, right? So the number of factors is, uh, you know, pre predetermined by the researcher, right? So, you know, if you are interested in testing from our French uh, factor models, like five, six, or whatever you like, and you can use this approach. Uh, we're not going to take a stand uh, on which factor, uh, how many number of factors, and which factors are the right one, uh, okay. at least in this paper. All right, that's kind of what, what, what I was wondering. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so obviously we cannot handle infinite number of uh, jump risks, uh, different jump risks. So, so we have to kind of consolidate uh, these jump sizes and uh, to, to narrow down the number of potential distinct jump risks. And this is what we do. Uh, precisely. So we're going to introduce a finite partition, uh, you know, uh, of R, uh, which is the, uh, the space where jump size is uh, take values uh, from. And we're going to define this to so-called partial jump processes, where, uh, you know, the FTGL basically collects those jump sizes that fall into the set BL. All right. So, uh, you know, so we have L plus one partitions. We're going to have uh, you know, L plus one uh, potential, uh, potential different risk factors. And for, uh, for uh, the partition from B1 to BL, uh, you know, you can consider them to be relatively larger jump sizes compared to B0. And they're gonna have distinct um, jump processes uh, like FTGL. Um, but for the smaller, uh, potentially smaller B0 uh, kind of jumps, uh, for those smaller sizes, uh, we can, we can, uh, in general, uh, combine that with a continuous component to create F tilde, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, uh, an, a factor that makes the continuous component and potentially a uh, small jump component. You know, uh, arguably you cannot, it's, it's very difficult to really separate uh, the small jumps and continuous component uh, from the empirical point of view. And also there's a lot of advantages of having uh, such a structure. So to be clear, so right now I defined L plus one new factors. Uh, there are L factors that are completely related to the jumps uh, of a particular size that belongs to a set of BL. And um, there, there is another factor that is a mixture of the continuous component and uh, one, one uh, potentially small jumps, FG zero. All right, so, and uh, you know, this setup allows for many special cases, if you think about it. Right, so if uh, B0 is the entire real line so that there's no distinct uh, jump, uh, you know, distinct jump risk factors, then um, the whole F is a single factor. So basically this factor can uh, include the continuous component and all the jump components. So if B0 is just zero, and um, then we will have, um, you know, different jump risk factors and the continuous factors. So in other words, you're gonna have different betas, right? So you're gonna have a continuous beta for the continuous component and a jump beta for each of those jump risk factors. Now, if B0 is minus A to A for some predetermined A, uh, you know, all the smaller jumps within set A, sorry, within this uh, B0 is gonna be combined with continuous component to share their beta and uh, all the large jumps will have their own betas. All right, so all these are special cases of the model that we can, uh, we can handle. So in what follows, I'm gonna stack all the jump factors in a multivariate uh, vector form. So F bar is going to be um, the jump factors. And um, uh, all right, so it's important to clarify that what is observable is the whole F, right? So we only observe this one market portfolio and uh, we don't 
separately observe, uh, we cannot separately observe continuous and jump components. So we have to estimate them. All right, so now let me talk about the asset prices. For asset prices, again, we're gonna uh, write it uh, in this uh, matrix notation where PT is M assets and um, each asset uh, loads on the continuous component, uh, sorry, uh, each asset could load on uh, the, um, the L plus one factors that we just defined. So beta C is the, is the risk loading for F tilde and beta J is the loading for F bar. So remember F bar is a purely jump risk and F tilde potentially contains a small jumps. All right, so the idiosyncratic part PI is a general Ito semi martingale So uh, if you compare our continuous time model with um, the discrete time counterpart, you can see that the linear relationship here is only specified instantaneously or locally. Uh, so uh, this is quite general in the sense that we can certainly handle, uh, you know, highly nonlinear uh, functions, right? So if you think about option pricing, black shots, you know, so we can, we can certainly handle very highly nonlinear functions in this case, unlike the standard linear factor model. Uh, you know, it, we, we also need a risk free rate uh, and uh, for simplicity, I mean, this is uh, very trivial to, to handle. So we're gonna let uh, risk free rate to be zero for use of presentation. All right, so, so now let me discuss um, the, uh, um, the, the, the issue about unbalanced panel. Um, you know, uh, we know that existing stocks typically have a finite left time and, uh, and also new stocks keep appearing. So we need to uh, define the active time interval for each stock, uh, which is uh, LM, script LM is, is the lifetime for each stock. Um, this is actually not going to change much uh, it's not gonna, uh, you know, uh, make our uh, procedure uh, more uh, difficult to analyze, uh, partially because uh, our asymptotic theory does not require any assumptions on the long run behavior of asset betas and idiosyncratic volatilities. So, so we 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 don't really uh, worry too much about uh, this active time window because uh, we essentially care about realizations eventually. So, um, you know, for clarity of my presentation to simplify the notation. We're going to ignore this issue here. All right. So uh, you know when we have uh, you know unbalanced panel, we just have to make sure when you're calculating individual betas, uh, when you're calculating risk premium for each cross section, you need to use uh, those that are alive, uh, not uh, you know you obviously cannot observe those uh, that already uh, disappeared from the sample. All right. So that's the ESF prices. Uh, now in terms of risk premium, uh, you know this is obviously the most important part. So we need to set this up well. Uh, you know, what is commonly called risk premium is in connection with a no arbitrage property. Uh, and we're gonna first look at this case where prices have no idiosyncratic part. So let's imagine we have a portfolio YT where phi SM is the uh, loading, it's a self-financing trading strategy. Uh, um, um, and it's, for, it's actually the loading for stock M and DPSM is actually the 10 S uh, return for uh, stock M. So this is a uh, this is an <clears throat> this is a portfolio. So we can certainly uh, rewrite it into the continuous component, and the martingale components, and um, and clearly, the Navi charge is possible if we can find a process phi such that all the martingale terms above vanish, but the drift part does not, right? So in order to avoid um, this, uh, we need to make sure that for all phi that belongs to the kernel space of this matrix beta. It should also belong to the kernel space of the, uh, the vector mu, right? So the vector mu. So uh, in other words, this implies that for any phi uh, transpose beta equals to zero, phi transpose mu needs to be equal to zero so as to avoid arbitrage opportunities. And this in turn implies that phi, uh, mu is actually spanned by beta for some lambda, which is uh, the vector of risk premium. But in general, um, there's idiosyncratic components uh, in asset prices, which might lead to uh, residual lambda TI. So uh, in its most general form, we should expect to have mu equals beta lambda plus lambda TI, where beta includes both the continuous uh, component and jump component, and the lambda also correspondingly have the continuous and jump risk premium. And you can alternatively arrive at this equation by a gers theorem, which is partially why the continuous time uh, setup is very nice. Of course, uh, you know, uh, here, uh, lambda t would be zero if we impose, uh, if we impose Ross's argument to route asymptotic arbitrage with a large number of assets. 
All right, so now let's, let me discuss identification, which is uh, uh, the most important part. And uh, you know, the estimators and the simulations are kind of, kind of easily follow this. So we consider a simple setting where F is simply the Brownian motion. And uh, we have one stock and its beta is just equal to one and we know it. Uh, so in this case, you know, because beta is equal to one and lambda ti is equal to zero. So mu is just equal to lambda. So estimating lambda is just estimating mu. Uh, and we know that uh, with a finite time span, it's impossible to constantly estimate mu. Uh, so, um, you know, but, but, but if you look at, uh, you know, pt0 minus, uh, sorry, ptn minus p0 for a increasing time span tn, um, this is actually a good estimator for the average risk premium. And uh, the estimation error is actually um, shrinking to zero and follows this normal distribution. So uh, this motivates us that we could potentially, um, you know, target the average risk premium, which is um, the integrated uh, local risk premium. So this is actually the parameters of interest that we're going to look at for this identification uh, reasons. Um, so we're going to define the capital lambda TC, lambda TJ, and correspondingly lambda T in this integration form. All right, so now how about lambda ti, right? Can we also identify that? The answer is a clear no, because um, this uh, equation has more parameters, uh, has, has more parameters than number of equations. So therefore we need to incur a certain, uh, you know, argument like in APT to kind of get rid of this lambda ti component. So uh, we basically make a different assumption that uh, the integrated lambda ti is negligible as t goes to infinity. So this should echo the assumption of alpha equals to zero in the classical two-pass setting, right? So when we ask in a classical Feynman battery question, we, all, we, all, we also encode this null hypothesis that alpha equals to zero so that we can consistently estimate the risk premium. All right, so now in order to identify lambda t, we need a cross-sectional regression, so beta t must be full rank. So this is another condition we need to ensure identification for lambda. And uh, finally, because beta t itself is not observable, we need to study its identification as well. So uh, the continuous component is easy, right? So we can simply use uh, the truncated realized covariance to identify uh, the local variations of beta t, so which is very easy. But for beta t j, it is another matter, right? So if we look at you know, what beta tg is, is basically the jump beta, is basically the jump beta, and uh, delta ptm is the jump components for, uh, for the m's stock, and delta f bar is the jumps of um, f bar, right? So uh, it is only possible to estimate beta tj at a jump time of f bar, and we have simply no way of estimating beta tj for any other values of t, at which points no jumps occur. So this is obvious. Right, so but in, on the other hand, to estimate the jump risk premium, we need estimates of lambda tj at any point in time. So the only way to solve this problem seems to impose that beta tj is a constant over the lifetime of a stock. So we're going to impose that basically the jump beta is uh, is effectively uh, constant over time, so that we can identify uh, the constant jump beta, and with which we can identify the jump risk premium, etc. All right, so that's it for identification. And, um, you know, so let me discuss the assumptions. So the assumptions are very similar to uh, the usual assumptions, uh, you know, the high frequency kind of matrix literature have been using, except that we can assume most of these processes are bounded instead of uh, locally bounded, uh, because we're gonna look at the expensive time span, the localization arguments we used to uh, have no longer works. So we need to make a stronger assumption on the boundedness of, of the processes. Um, right, so that's all I wanna say on this slides. And, and then uh, let, me, let me discuss uh, a few more assumptions here. So assumption three basically is, uh, requires that uh, we have um, enough jump betas that span, um, uh, that, that span the space uh, you know, with uh, enough, uh, with, with, uh, with less degree of freedoms than the uh, number of equations we have. So, um, so that we can estimate the jump beta. Uh, and assumption four uh, basically imposes that um, jump beta is a constant uh, in, the, in the lifetime of a stock. Uh, and also um, beta T transpose beta is invertible so that we can identify the lambdas. 
Um, and uh, you know, assumption five is this uh, uh, risk premium, risk premium, uh, sorry, is this Gerson dog, is what Gerson dog theorem can give you. And we need um, that uh, lambda ti component uh, negligible, become negligible, uh, you know, uh, and this is like the alpha equals to zero assumption we need. All right, so that's pretty much all we need. And now let me discuss the estimation. Uh, so first of all, we're gonna estimate the jump loadings. So for that, we need to uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, collect all of those uh, factors, factor jumps uh, that fall into the set B, uh, BL and or BH here. So uh, we collect all of those uh, returns that fall into this uh, large, uh, fall into this uh, jump size cluster. And then uh, we use the usual uh, regression over the entire time span to estimate uh, the jump beta because jump beta is constant. Uh, so here we need to be very careful about the uh, uh, lifetime of a stock. Uh, to, to make sure uh, to, to make to, to, to make sure that we don't use uh, stock returns that have already uh, not uh, no, not exist. All right. And for the continuous component, we use the usual approach. We take a local window of size QN and uh, we're gonna truncate um, the returns of the factors to get rid of the jumps. and we can estimate the covariance matrix of the factors uh, locally. And then uh, we can uh, basically estimate the spot covariance between F and each stock. Uh, of course, uh, their truncated version and over the lifetime of a stock. And then we can estimate uh, the continuous beta for each stock uh, only looking at, you know, using this component. Uh, of course, uh, there is a tiny technical detail that we have to avoid having, uh, you know, the matrix not invertible or close to be singular. So, so that's why we have this uh, assumption. So we have this procedure at the bottom to, to make sure that the smallest eigenvalue, so theta here is the smallest eigenvalue of this covariance matrix is greater than the certain threshold. All right, so once we have the local estimates of the continuous component and global estimates of the jump component, we can start uh, estimating uh, the risk premium. So uh, eta here is basically the usual beta transpose beta inverse beta transpose. And uh, P, uh, the difference of P is basically the uh, future return. So here, uh, you know, this is essentially a local estimate of risk premium using future return, regress on the estimated betas, regress on the estimated betas. So, so in this regard, our estimate of risk premium has a similar form to the Fama McBath procedure, where we estimate, uh, you know, uh, local risk premium and pick their averages. And the symptotic variance is going to be also similar. So you have the local risk premium. So it's basically the average. Uh, it's basically the second moment of local risk premium, effectively. All right. So that's our estimator. Now, in terms of the symptotics, uh, you know, of course, we have two components, T n and delta n we need to make sure that they converge at the right rate. So T goes to infinity, data goes to zero. Uh, and uh, under this condition, uh, we can arrive at the central limit theorem uh, to be shown in the next slides. So there are some tuning parameters. Uh, some of them might be important. So this is kind of the jump truncation. Um, this is a local window size. And VN is not really important because it's just trying to um, get rid of the singular covariance matrices uh, potentially in finite sample. So this one is not really important. All right, so under these conditions and we can arrive at um, the CLT where uh, we have the standard on uh, the CLT, uh, you know, uh, uh, but, but here we, we kind of allow T goes to infinity. So uh, the convergence rate here is actually the square root of TN. All right, so delta n just need to be small enough. Uh, and, uh, and then the convergence rate is actually square root of Tn. All right, so uh, one thing to notice that uh, lambda Tn is a moving target, right? It's the, some kind of the integrated average, which could converge to a limit if we would like to make more assumptions such as ergodicity, uh, et cetera. But because, uh, you know, even if this is the case, because the observations available says says nothing about what happens after time t. So the only way to estimate lambda infinity, if we really want to do that, would essentially use the same estimator, right? So, and just rely on the symptotic assumptions to allow our lambda t and to converge to lambda infinity. So we avoid this actual step here, which permits substantially weaker assumptions 
because we don't need ergodicity and all this stationarity and et cetera, and these type of assumptions. All right, so I probably have no time to discuss the Monte Carlos. Uh, and uh, one thing to notice is that, you know, we're gonna have, say in the simulations, we have three factors and each factor has two jump components and the small jumps are kind of combined with their continuous component to share one beta. Uh, and two jump components have their individual betas. So what I want to show you here is that, you know, this is a 10 year sample with a five minute sampling frequency and for different, you know, monthly, uh, bi-weekly and a quarterly window, you can see the root mean square error is really large relative to the truth. And so the standard deviation, right? So mainly driven by the standard deviation. So the truth is, uh, is about this large and the root mean square error is, uh, is really large. So everything here is in percentage, right? So the risk premium is 2% annualized and uh, the root mean square error is really large. So now if we look at uh, 10 year with 15 minutes, the root mean square error is actually roughly the same, right? So this kind of verifies our theory. So what determines the accuracy is the square root of T, not really uh, the sampling frequency. Of course, higher frequency helps. And now, you know, as you can see, if we drop the sampling uh, you know, the, the time span to five years, the room mean square error uh, increases substantially. All right, so uh, can this give us an uh, indication that clearly we need a long span to make sure that we could have potentially significant estimates for this premium. Uh, the sampling frequency, we can work with a safer frequency like 15 minutes to avoid some concerns about microstructure noise and et cetera. So this is kind of the histogram of standardized estimates and clearly our theory works really well uh, in this setting. All right, so let me discuss the empirical analysis uh, with the final two minutes. So we collect data from the entire cross-section of individual stocks at 15 minutes frequency for components of S&P uh, 1500, right? So we have 500 large stop, 400 mid cap, and 600 small cap. And we have a 15 year sample covering all kinds of crises, including the uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, we look at 15 minute snapshots of Pharma French five factors plus momentum. And these factors were constructed in the earlier work uh, with Yassin and, uh, and Yilzi. Um, and uh, you, know, you can use these factors um, uh, as well. You can download them from my website. So uh, these are factor returns at a 15 minute frequency uh, and high frequency, right? So this is high frequency factors. Uh, we basically repeat the Pharma French approach, and uh, we also match their returns at a very high accuracy, like beyond 99% correlation if we aggregate high frequency returns at, uh, to monthly frequency. And, um, and now uh, here I am showing you the jump components of these factors. And if, as you can see, uh, you know, um, these systematic factors have jumps as well, uh, in particular momentum. Uh, in earlier years, uh, before 2003, um, the concern on mar market microstructure is a bit um, serious. So we, of course, do some subsample analysis, uh, ruling out uh, earlier, earlier days. All right, so let me conclude with this uh, slide. So on this slide, uh, we are estimating, uh, you know, the risk premium uh, for a model where we have, uh, you know, um, six factors. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, risk components. So for the market, we have a continuous and small jumps as one component and the large negative jumps, large positive jumps. For the other five factors, size, value, investment, you know, et cetera, profit, uh, profitability, et cetera. So we, we're gonna have the continuous component and jump component separately. All right, so uh, this is uh, as, uh, an obvious, uh, you know, uh, benchmark uh, specification that we consider. And what we find, first of all, is that the large negative jump risk premium is uh, large and significant. And uh, for the HML, CMA, and the momentum, we find that uh, it's their jump components in general uh, have a significant uh, risk premium. So the numbers in the brackets are T-stats, all right? So, um, and, and as you can see, uh, it's the jump components that actually supersede the continuous component in the cross-sectional regressions. And as you can see, as the model becomes more, uh, you know, uh, complex, um, the R-square actually also increases uh, uh, substantially. So uh, from single factor model to the six factor model. Um, and, uh, you know, so those are cross-sectional, kind of cross-sectional average R-squares. Uh, so it's actually quite high for individual stocks, uh, for individual stocks. All right, so, um, 
And uh, you know, so uh, I basically covered uh, I basically covered these points. Now let me conclude. All right. So in this paper, uh, we propose this uh, new approach um, to identify the risk premium using high frequency data. The prior literature on high frequency gamma metrics has made a lot of progress on characterizing the second order moments in the form of quadratic variations. Uh, but in this paper, we kind of uh, bridge the gap between this literature to asset pricing literature where uh, first order moments are actually uh, very interesting and, and important to understand some economics. And um, you know, so uh, the techniques that we develop here can be employed uh, in future work, for example, to test the specification of canonical asset pricing models, to estimate alphas, to conduct event studies, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of uh, you know, stuff that can be done uh, when we kind of consider this uh, long time span, the small data asymptotics. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Dutching. That's very interesting. That's great. And, and also right on time. So uh, now I'll turn it over to George Tauken, the discussant for today. All right. Uh, this is a, uh, oh, it's a very interesting paper. Uh, it's a sort of a comprehensive paper, and um, I, I learned I learned a lot in uh, in, in in reading it. So uh, let's start with just a few general remarks. It, it's a very innovative paper, and something I really want to emphasize is it respects the page constraints. The paper I was sent was about 45, 46 pages with a handful of tables and a handful of, but you know, just a few tables and a few numbers. The editors are screening that they want, you know, ordinary length papers, getting the paper down to the, you know, ordinary length that humans can understand. It's a lot of work. And, and, and the authors put in, um, uh, did put in a lot of work into that. So I, I really think they need, uh, uh, they, they deserve your note for respecting the page constraints, not dumping uh, you know, 80 pages on the reader and expecting the reader to go through all these, all this uh, uh, text and tables and whatnot, trying to figure out what's going on. With that said, there are some exposition issues. Uh, and those, I think, could be fixed by one more rewrite of, of the paper. Okay, what does the paper do? It melds uh, two huge streams of literature, the, the high frequency literature that many of us are familiar with. And then the cross-sectional, uh, the Fama French literature, which I think, well, many of us are, uh, are more, more spectators uh, uh, for that. Some of us are, are, are participants. Uh, but I want to put these two, the objective of the paper is to put these two uh, streams together. And that's a very big project. So you're going to need a large, dense data set to do this. Uh, the main relation of interest is that the, fact, the vector of mean excess returns has to lie in the column space of the factor loading matrix, that's just the APT restriction. Um, factor loadings pertain to second moments, and as Da Cheng pointed out, high frequency becomes very helpful. Uh, for, for, for means, uh, they pertain to first moment, and, and you just have to have a long span. So uh, uh, to, to use this methodology, you have to buy into that. Okay, and uh, let me just give you an overview. Uh, it, the paper's written in terms of log price processes, but I'm told that when it was actually implemented, it used uh, arithmetic returns uh, to, to avoid all the issues associated with uh, uh, the difference between arithmetic and geometric returns. So log, uh, log prices here are just, uh, um, you know, for expositional purposes. So just think about a factor model as I've got here in the first display, uh, the increment of the price. These, I, I, I subtracted off the risk-free rate. It, it's, just, it's just too big of a nuisance to keep track. So mu t, these are excess returns here. And then this is the factor loading matrix. M is huge, you know, like on the order of 1300. K is small on the order of three, five, seven, nine, depending upon how many systematic factors you have. Then there's an idiosyncratic component. Uh, and then this model here is chugging along in in continuous time. Uh, span is long and the number of factors is, as I said, small and observed. And of course, the main uh, APT restriction is that the excess return vector, uh, well, if, we have any, if we have any portfolio that knocks out all the systematic part, 
uh, then um, uh, the new, the excess returns also got to be uh, orthogonal to that vector, or there would sort of be uh, money earned without uh, without bearing risk. I I don't quite understand this difference between allowing some idiosyncratic price risk uh, in the short, you know, you know, you know, instantaneously that averages out over time. I mean, my thinking has always just been sort of kind of classic APT style thinking where the uh, uh, readily the uh, uh, an easier way to state it is that the vector of excess returns, this is long, it would be like 1300 uh, elements to it, uh, has got to be in the column space of the exposures, the Bs. And the, the Bs here are, are continuous uh, betas and jump betas. And lambda T are the, uh, are the risk premiums some people call these the risk prices. And then the central objective of the paper is to develop an operational asymptotic theory for what you might think of as being the average risk premium over the sample period, uh, which is this object down here. Okay. I'm not, if, I, I think the discussion is easier if, if we speak concretely. So I'll sort of talk in terms of the, the, the way the application is done and the also the um, uh, kind of the, one of the main um, terms of the uh, Monte Carlo. So I, I want to want to get specific here. The data are January 1, 1996, May 31st, 2020. It's about 300 months, uh, 21 business days per month. There are 26 um, 15 minute high frequency observations per day. I, I still not completely clear how the overnight return was, was handled, but uh, that, that can be fixed in a revision. So this you have this for 1,300 stocks and three, more, three or more factors, uh, you know, three, three, five, eight, and depending on how you decompose the jumps and that kind of stuff. Now the paper uses 15 minute data on low cap thinly traded stocks. And I, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at those data. Uh, I have, and uh, I've had some students have it. And, and the market frictions are just different than the standard noise. Uh, that there's long periods of inactivity, zero returns, and, and big wide bid ass spreads. I think the uh, semi martingale approximation, I, it, it actually becomes doubtful. That doesn't violate any arbitrage because you can't, you can't trade the thing continuously, which is where that semi martingale approximation uh, is, is is, ju is justified. Uh, so I, I'm a little dubious of including all those uh, uh, small um, uh, thinly traded stocks in, in, the, uh, in the analysis. There, there, is a, there is a robustness check in, in the paper, but what it does is it just splits the, sa the, the sample in half, argues that in the later half, the, 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 this, this effect is smaller. I'm not convinced of that, uh, but uh, and, uh, this noise effect is smaller, and then they get somewhat the same result. But if you compare, you know, two periods both affected by the same thing, you're not going to show much difference. And then, see, each month we have to estimate. Just, just talking about the diffusive part, uh, 1300. If you have three factors, you got to estimate uh, 1300 by three exposures, diffusive betas. And then you have it's not bad. It's it's it, there are 21 days, 26 high frequency observation, that's, so it's 546 data points you know, per, per beta here, but there are 3,900 of them. And then this gets repeated for each month. So I, I'm really kind of unsure about the effect of these grungy data here uh, on, on, on this whole computation. And I, I think the paper needs more things like some volatility signature plots or summary of volatility signature plots and other things as diagnostic, especially on these uh, 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 thinly traded stocks. How does it work? It's uh, Fama Macbeth. Uh, da Sheng tried to explain, Da Sheng explained it. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me try a little bit different way. Uh, so we separate the data into monthly 21 day sub intervals, disjoint. Uh, and uh, within each month, we estimate the factor loadings matrix for the diffusive betas and then the, the, the jump data are handled a little bit differently. But anyways, you've got those for that month. And then, so that's the first step, follow the math. Second step, uh, we regress next period's return 
on this period's exposures and average. So lambda had this actually should be a uppercase lambda, but uh, it isn't. Uh, so what you do, it's just it just uh, sum x prime x inverse x prime y. Y here would be on the order of thirteen hundred. Beta hat's got uh, beta transpose got thirteen hundred rows, so this is this is conformable. Uh, but now remember that the the return next period satisfies the APT restriction, so you can kind of plug it in. I've abused the notation a bit. You can sort of think of it as being the uh, sort of the, the, the this point in time exposure next period times kind of the average lambda over that small period over that month. Then there's going to be a Martindale component and then small part. And I mean, small, I mean, this is really hard. The, these asymptotics are really, really hard. So just saying small is small that is takes a lot of work. Or you could distribute the, uh, the x prime x inverse x prime through all this. You wind up with this term down here at the bottom on the lambda t's uh, on, on the lambda j, uh, the, the martingale gets preserved because this is stuff dated the month before and small gets preserved as well. And if you look at that, what's gonna happen is as the uh, sampling frequency gets higher, the precision of the estimates of the, of the beta hats, the beta hats are gonna start looking more and more like the bees and as the intervals get small, the Vs look more or less like constants. And so this thing here is just going to look like uh, the sum of a bunch of, you know, just a sum of identity matrices times the uh, times these little local average um, risk um, uh, risk prices or risk prices. So then asymptotically, if uh, if things are tuned properly. Uh, and and uh, it takes a lot of tuning. That's one of my uh, sort of points about the paper is that it's too bad that uh, uh, there are so many tuning parameters floating around in this and they got to kind of be set just right. Uh, some guidance is given in the papers for, for the user. But anyways, uh, if we, uh, uh, when everything's tuned right, what we get is that the difference between uh, the Cesaro sum here and this, uh, think of it as an uppercase lambda, uh, converges in appropriately like in probability to zero. And then we also have a viable um, asymptotic uh, theory for, the, uh, for this average. And remember what, what, we're, what, we're est what, what we're talking about here, go back to the APT restriction, the excess returns uh, have got to be in the column space of the loadings. And so we just break off we just we, so we can kind of disentangle the lambda here from the exposures, and uh, this there are only there aren't that many lambdas that are estimated. There are like four, five, eight, ten, um, uh, ten here. So we can estimate the integrated risk premiums, and 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 make inferences about them to the extent that uh, we find the integrated uh, risk premium useful. Um, uh, jump regressions. The discussion in sections one through three just 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 need um, clarification. Uh, I couldn't figure it out, and I went to the application. I thought, well, maybe we look at the application. I can figure out how it works. Still couldn't figure out how it worked. I had a couple of emails with Dai Shang, uh, thought I had figured it out, and then in the middle of the night, <laughs> I got one more email saying, no, that wasn't quite uh, that wasn't quite it. Although it certainly looks like this. Uh, the paper uses essentially the conventional approach. You classify the returns more than three local standard deviations in magnitude as jumps, and then you run OLS uh, regressions uh, at the jump times over the entire span, very much like uh, Victor, John, uh, John, and I and and and, and co-authors um, uh, did. Um, there may be some throwing out. Sometimes we have to throw out uh, kind of in low volatility periods. You know, small, small, small moves that the classifier thinks is a jump, but just it just isn't. Uh, and uh, but 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 we but that 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 can be done. I think that maybe what's going on here as well. Uh, the precision can be approved. We, you know, you're in an environment where you can't estimate things very precisely, and you can improve the precision of these jump betas uh, by using a, a, a weighted least squares procedure. Also. From the earlier work, there's evidence that the jump betas remain constant only over segments of say about a year. Uh, 25 years is really a stretch. You think of something like General Electric, 
25 years ago uh, versus General Electric now, uh, it's a stretch to think it's jumped day to the same. I mean, that would be easy to fix. You could estimate over it at a couple of, you know, you could sort of gradually uh, stick in um, uh, uh, updated uh, betas into the, um, into, the, um, into the exposure. And also, as best I can tell, um, the, I don't know quite what the paper means when it says it takes account of the sampling error estimating the um, the exposures, I, I don't actually see it. Uh, the exposure, it, it looks to me like you're just using the consistency of this from, from staring at the asymptotic formulas and also in the presence of jumps and uh, the theory allows for co-jumps between the, the volatility and the, um, uh, between the volatility uh, and, and the, uh, uh, factor jump itself, and that actually kind of goofs, that kind of makes the, the asymptotic distribution of beta hat uh, a little bit uh, non-standard uh, because of some, some uh, issues related to volatility pre and, pre and post jump. And, and none, of, none of that ever showed up in this. So I'm, I'm not actually sure that the, for, in the first order approximations that the estimation of the, of the jump um, exposure that, matrices plays a role, but I, you know, I'll listen to an argument. Okay. Uh, now I want to comment some on the Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is pretty important uh, for something, you know, for this monstrous thing. Um, uh, the DGP always generates nice clean data sets uh, in contrast to the actual data. So the, the, the procedure is looking at cleaner data than, than it's actually looking at in the, uh, in the application. And this I don't understand. The jumps follow a uniform distribution uh, minus A to A that gets separated um, into uh, large negative, large peasant, and small jump. I think they get folded into the fusion. What I really don't understand is, is the uniform assumption. Uh, even if you look at the plots of the densities of the uh, jumps in, uh, in, in the paper, they don't look like uh, the um, uh, they don't look like they're uniform. Also, another thing, as best I can tell, the sizes of the jumps, this A parameter, it doesn't scale with the overall level of stochastic volatility, whereas the data are otherwise. If you look at the, Dasheng showed it. Uh, if you look at the time series plots of just the jumps, you see that that in periods of high high diffusive volatility, they're very large in their volatility, and then in periods of low diffusive volatility, they uh, uh, they just the volatility of the jump size is just just kind of follows uh, the overall level of, of volatility, and in and um, what that the effect of that is that with fixed size jumps, it's going to make it easier in the Monte Carlo to detect jumps. Uh, than in the data in, in the quiescent. In the, so when it's really quiet, volatility is low, those, those fixed size jumps are really going to stand out, uh, but uh, that, that doesn't happen in the uh, data. So it kind of gives an advantage to the procedure. Uh, let me skip this thing. Um, uh, the figures with the asymptotic distribution are, uh, they're, they're helpful, um, but we only really care about the tail maybe nitpicking, but uh, I, I might rather see uh, uh, accuracy on the uh, related to the to the coverage rates to say wall confidence interval or something like that, where, where everyone is concerned about uh, the, the T statistics, that, that's what they look at in these things. And then it would be nice to see the quantiles of the, you know, of the T's and the simulation, uh, you, know, you, know, how, you know, how accurate they are. Um, so uh, last to uh, finish it up, uh, the empirical findings. I'm not a Fama French person, so I just stopped at the three factor. Uh, but Da Sheng mentioned some inferences, interesting inferences that can be made about four and five factor Fama French. Uh, one, uh, uh, there's a strong crash of phobia effect through negative market jumps. This has been around for a long time. Uh, it goes back to, uh, you know, you know, people were plotting uh, the risk neutral distribution from the options and versus that of the, you know, the kind of the data. And they saw, saw this long left hand tail, which is just the crashophobia, which shows up here. It shows up in work with uh, uh, 
uh, Victor and Torben and, and various uh, co-authors. Uh, um, and so this kind of confirms that. Uh, the, I don't really know what to make of these, but you can learn some interesting things. The size effect, small minus big, that uh, seems to operate through the diffusive component. And the value effect, high minus low, seems to operate through its jump component. All right. And what I, what I think is possibly the, the weakest part of the paper that I think really needs to be modified is that it, it has a contrast with a, with the, with, with a, a usual Fama French low frequency model, but it do, it's done through what seems to be a very flimsy version of uh, using daily data. Uh, if, if you look at, if you look at their, their estimates, uh, if you look at the estimates for that model, um, the only factor that's significant is the market. Uh, uh, you know, all the other small minus big, high minus low, all that other stuff, it's just everything's insignificant. And, and I think it's going to be viewed as uh, somewhat, um, it's going to be viewed by, it's, it's going to be viewed with askance by someone who, you know, you know is, a, is a hardcore uh, Fama French kind of person. And it really needs a, 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 better, uh, a better alternative to make, to make the contrast. Um, and uh, that's all. Okay, thanks, George. Sure. And that run a bit over, but you're running, raising so many good questions. I thought uh, I thought I would do that. Oh, now, Chang, okay. maybe the right thing to do is um, I'll let you respond, and then we'll do follow up questions and stuff in the post seminar session. So, but if you'd like to to respond to whatever you feel like responding to, uh, please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you so much for the insightful comments. I mean, there's a lot I'd like to respond to, uh, but but I have very limited time. So let me quickly go over my slides here. First of all, about um, the comparison with low frequency, which we didn't show here. Uh, but remember, we are dealing with individual stock returns. With individual stock returns, I mean, Fama French models just cannot work well. And this is, um, you know, a, a known result. Uh, so in terms of the um, uh, simulations, um, uh, right, so we use a uniform distribution for the jumps, and uh, we certainly can change it to double exponential, for example. And we actually have done it. The results are similar. The only reason we choose uniform because of our assumption of bounded jump sizes. So uniform is very convenient for that. Uh, in terms of the semantics, the error for the jumps, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the error for the betas, uh, you know, in the classical setting, uh, the Schenken adjustment showed up um, because of the uh, estimation error in the first pass, uh, but the uh, you know it's it's never very uh, important if you calculate the scale uh, of Schenck adjustment is is not really important and it and it and it disappears if you have a large cross section. So here, interestingly, you know we have to choose the right data and the t uh, in a way such that um, this higher frequency um, you know beta estimation error. Uh, disappears. And this makes not only makes the inference procedure uh, convenient, uh, it is also, uh, I think it's also um, the limit, uh, you know, it's, it's actually feasible. Uh, if, uh, you know, taking into account um, the first stage estimation error and show up in the syntactics is, um, you know, makes the very challenge to, to, to have a feasible CLT, uh, if I recall correctly, because we have jump betas, we have continuous betas, and I mean, there's no reason of doing that, given that um, the CLT works so well. Uh, in terms of tuning parameters, as I explained, there are three of, uh, two, uh, three of them, but really two of them. The first one is basically the jump truncation, which is well established in the literature. The second one is the local window size, which we use a monthly window uh, in accordance with the existing literature. And mu n is just to get rid of the small sample issues. So you can totally change it, choose it to anything you like. It does not change anything. So it's not important. I mean, it's mainly for theory to, to, to make it to look, look nicer. Uh, you know, and then in terms of the um, um, uh, theory, uh, by the way, uh, you know, we, 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 we discussed the empirical, uh, you know, um, George discussed the empirical analysis. Uh, I, I think this is actually a long word due to project, I mean, we, which could have been done like five or 10 years ago. And one reason for that is, uh, you know, we don't have very good quality data uh, for, for high frequency side, right? So. You know, looking forward, I mean, I think, you know, given that their quality becomes even better, I mean, this procedure can certainly be, uh, be used uh, in the future. And in addition, uh, you know, our theory was developed for dirt angles to zero. 
and does not have to use intraday data, right? So you, we can certainly try, for example, simulations with daily frequency uh, for data. You know, it, it's, it, it seems fine with us uh, in some simulation exercises we have done before. I think I'd have no time left. Uh, uh, one last point that I want to address is, um, you know, the arbitrage assumptions, right? So this is really by Gersendorf. In the most general case, this is assumption, and this is the results you're going to get from Gersendorf. Obviously, you have mu number, you have number of equations equal to the dimension of mu, but the lambda and the lambda ti are, have too many parameters. So you have to impose certain things to get rid of those. And instead of using the Ross's argument, which directly says all this lambda t needs to be zero when you have a large cross section. So here we have a fixed cross section. And uh, so we'd prefer something else. And uh, this is why we impose that lambda ti goes to zero as t goes to infinity, uh, which is kind of our version of it. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much for the insightful uh, discussion. Uh, we, we're certainly going to incorporate many of these useful comments in our paper. All right, great. Thank you, Jiaqing. Well, if you wouldn't mind stopping to share your screen. Sure. Thank you. All right. I think this is a good place to, to end the formal part of the, the session. So let me thank our speaker, Da Cheng Zhu. And how can, if you have further questions, please stick around after we stop the recording. Um, we'll do some more questions there. But before we end the seminar, let me do an advertisement for the next SOPI seminar. The next SOPI seminar will be in two weeks' time. Uh, November 30, our speaker will be Ross Valkanov from UC San Diego, and his discussion will be Egon Zakrasek from the Bank for International Sentiments and the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, that'll be our last SOPI seminar for 2020, but um, we'll be continuing this series on into 2021. So please join us in a couple of weeks' time for the next Sophie Seminar.